so thankful you're here today. Welcome, and I think everybody has said Happy Mother's Day, but we want to make sure that you really feel that and you feel loved and, and cherished and those types of things. And uh, man, we're grateful you're here. As I said, my name's Todd, and me and my wife Avery get to uh, uh, the service of lead pastors around this place. And man, one of uh, our distinctives around here is we're not afraid to ham- hand a woman a microphone. I know that's a little different than some Southern churches, um, but it's distinctive around here that we believe that women have the call to teach and lead in divine positions as ordained by God. And we're not going to be a church that lets uh, women teach your kids and not let them on this platform. I just want you to know that from me. Um, So uh, every lady, every young lady in this room, when you hear Pastor Avery speak or Pastor Jesse speak or any of our other ladies that speak on the stage, I want you to know you're a gift from God given to this house and we value you and we value your voice in this place. So... Uh, I want to invite Pastor Avery up to come join us. Uh, she told me I can't take too much time because she got to preach. Uh, but I do want to take a minute and just uh, say publicly how much she means to our church. You guys have no idea uh, the weight that she carries. She has encouraged me and she has been a voice. She's done every job in this church from kids ministry to trash detail to bathroom duty. And she can carry a microphone. And we're grateful for who she is and her voice in this house. Come on, y'all give it up for Pastor Avery. He made me cry first service, so I said he can't say all that again. (laughs) Well, good morning, and uh, I just want to say happy Mother's Day to my mom and my grandmother. They're back there in the back, and I just want to wish them a happy Mother's Day, uh, mostly because I forgot to bring my mom's card, uh, but I've heard there's some cards on the premises if anybody else uh, forgot to. So, but happy Mother's Day to my mom and grandma. And uh, I am just so excited to be uh, getting to speak again in this series, Unexpected. If you have not been with us the past about five weeks, we have been in a series called Unexpected, which is a series where we've been talking about the unexpected life and ministry of Jesus, how the Jewish people, they were expecting a Messiah, but when Jesus showed up and a lot of what he did was so unexpected, they didn't expect it in Jesus. And so I've just been loving this series. And if you have not listened to all of the messages, if you haven't been here every week, I encourage you to go back and listen. But in particular, I want to talk about something that was said last week. How many of you guys were here for last week's message. Okay, great. I need to clear a little something up because I wasn't here, but I was watching online. And I have never, ever throat punched a heifer for a microwave. Okay, and if you weren't here last week, then you need to go back and watch last week's sermon. But I have never throat punched a heifer on Black Friday for a microwave. It was shoes. Can I get an amen, right? I'm just kidding. I've never done it for shoes either. Close, I've come close to fighting over some shoes, but I don't need no microwave on Black Friday. I need some shoes, right, ladies? All right, that's why I get up that early. (laughs) But what Pastor Todd talked about last week was the fact that we do not need to be afraid of the dark. And he talked about how Jesus would get up early in the dark hours, and he would meet with his father, and that we needed to create some of those same disciplines in our life, and so we should not be afraid to get up and meet with Jesus and to create some disciplines in our life. And so you need to go back and listen to that if you have not. And I'm gonna kind of continue with this discipline conversation today, but where I wanna go with it is that when we develop disciplines, those disciplines develop us. When we develop disciplines, those disciplines develop us. So let's just say, take, take physical disciplines, because working out is like the most accurate picture of this, right? If you start working out, and you work out every day, and you get serious about it, and you create those disciplines, those disciplines will eventually start developing your physical body, right? Your muscles will start to get stronger. They'll hopefully get a little more tone. You'll start to lose some weight. Your, your health actually improves. Your immune system improves, right? And so, uh, and toxic things will leave your body, and when you develop those physical physical disciplines, then those will develop you. Same spiritually. When you start to develop spiritual disciplines in your life, 
Your spiritual body gets healthier. Your spiritual muscles get healthier. You grow. You begin to develop. Toxic things get out of your life. Toxic people. You start, and, and you start to develop the disciplines that then begin to develop you. So here's the deal, though. Just like working out, you could go work out every day and then not actually take it seriously, not put a whole lot of effort into it, maybe decide that I'm gonna work out but I'm gonna still eat 15 Krispy Kreme donuts or whatever, and you're not gonna see much change in your lifestyle. It can be that same way spiritually too. You can decide to get up every day and start meeting with God, but then not make the changes that you should be making, that God's showing you to make, he's revealing to you to make, the things that are trying to develop you, you can resist those things and then not see much change. And I wanna make this clear, this is not a salvation thing. You can do nothing. Like there's no amount of work that you can do to earn your salvation. You come to Jesus and, and Jesus saves you, right? This is about after you come to know Jesus. These are developing spiritual disciplines in your walk with the Lord. So again, when we develop spiritual disciplines, those disciplines will develop us. They will, but here's the problem. In the past about 10 years, we have gotten to this place where we put less and less value on the process of development. Less and less value because we live in an instant culture and an I want it now culture. And not only that, I mean, I'm thankful. I'm thankful for the ship shopper who can go get my groceries for me and two hours later they show up on my doorstep. Hallelujah, that has changed my life, right? But the thing is, is that we have to value what can be developed in us. Uh, my husband and I, we love to go walking in the springtime in our neighborhood. And my neighbor, Dave, has the most beautiful yard. I mean, it is gorgeous. If we had yard of the month club, I think Dave would probably win it every single month. And I want grass like Dave's grass. I want it. I want my yard to look like Dave's yard. But guess what? I don't necessarily want to take the time to invest what Dave has invested into his yard, to develop what has been developed in his yard, right? And, and it, that is the struggle sometimes. We want it, but we don't know if we want to take what it takes to develop it. But yesterday, I got out in my yard, and I decided to start investing into my yard, okay? And what I have to remember is that there is a long game at play. And what I'm doing today what I'm investing today is for the yard I want a couple years from now. That is what you're doing spiritually. When you start getting these spiritual disciplines going in your life, don't give up when you don't see something immediate. Don't give up. We have Amazon primed our lives so much that we don't want to take any effort to do anything. And that is going to be very dangerous. This next generation, those of you who literally everything is an instant, you don't even know what it means to develop something, you need to learn how to develop things in your life. Because this life is not going to get any easier, even with all of the modern conveniences. You have got to learn how to put some effort in to get really, really good things out. So when we start talking about developing our faith and our relationship with God, there's gonna be a few of us sitting in this room who aren't gonna take the journey because we want the faith, but we don't wanna do what it takes to walk it out. And I wanna encourage you today that as you have been listening to us over the past few weeks, take those steps. Start creating these spiritual disciplines in your life because it will be worth it. Now, when I think about the word develop, I'm a photographer, I have loved photography my whole life. And when I think about the word develop, it, I immediately go to what it takes to develop film. Anybody still remember film? Okay, a few of you. Uh, film's actually making a comeback, which is really cool. Anybody have no clue what film is? Do I have some? Okay, we got some people. Don't, don't have any clue what film is. Film is this old school way to take a picture. <laughs> You used to have to actually take a picture on film. So the, the reason some people have no clue what film is is because the entire process of taking a photo has completely changed since the invention of this thing. The entire process, what it actually takes to develop a photo is not even the same anymore. In fact, I literally can just flip up like this, go to my camera, and I can take a selfie with you guys right now. So you guys smile. Well, I got it. Okay, I'm old, so okay. All right. Okay, you right on the end, scoot, yeah, scooch in. Yeah, okay, right there, smile. Okay, right? And then I got my photo, just like that. 
And in an instant, I could post that thing. And across the whole world, somebody could see that picture. But we want a developed faith in an iPhone camera world. And that just isn't the way that it works. That isn't, you can't just have instant faith. You can't just, just read your Bible one morning and all of a sudden, you're there. You can't do that. The thing is, is that we don't need the dark room anymore to take a picture. We don't need the dark room anymore to take a picture. We want the instant faith. And the problem is with that is when you're looking at somebody on a 30 second clip on YouTube or you're even listening to a 45 minute sermon up here and we're talking to you about these things, the problem is, is you don't realize what it took years to develop to get there. So on that little 30 second clip or when you, when you see that picture on Pinterest or Instagram of that girl's Bible that's got like highlighted, anybody ever seen the highlighter girl who like has it all highlighted different ways, right? And, and we can't even keep our 3.3 second attention span long enough to see what it took for her to even get to that place. The years of study it took for her to get to that place. And she's trying to teach you something, but you're just scrolling on to the next thing because we don't even want to make the effort. And we have got to realize that it is going to take an investment into our faith. We have got to want the dark room. And the guy who doesn't know what film is, he's like, what's the dark room? <laughs> well, the dark room is where you used to have to send your film to get developed. Because in order for a picture to actually come out as a picture uh, to hang on your wall, you used to have to go through a whole process. And they would have to send that film and it would go into the dark room and the dark room was literally this completely dark room because if any light hits that film too soon, it messes the whole process up. But you gotta go into the dark room and then the light as well as like nine other chemical processes go in to that film, to that picture, and it creates a picture. And it's an incredible process. And the development process is an incredible and powerful process as well. And this is what I wanna to explain to you is that Jesus wants to do the same thing in your life. He wants you to not be afraid of the dark, go into the dark room with him, develop these spiritual disciplines and watch what happens when you get into the dark room and meet with the light. He wants you to do that. And so we're gonna talk about that today. We're gonna talk about that today. I want to talk about a little bit of an unexpected passage of scripture where Jesus kind of shows up on the scene and he shakes some things up today. And we're going to look in John chapter eight. And so if you have your Bibles, you can go with me there. If you don't have your Bibles, it's okay. It is going to be on the screen. Uh, but I want to set up what is happening here in this passage of scripture. So John chapter eight um, is taking place somewhere in the festival of tabernacle or feast of tabernacle is what it was called. And it was a three day long festival. And Jesus shows up at this uh, festival. And he starts teaching and he is walking around the tabernacle and around the city and he's teaching all sorts of things. Because again, the Jewish people were expecting a Messiah, but when Jesus starts to be claiming to be him, they're kind of like, whoa, what do we do with this guy? And so he's, he's saying things like, I am the son of God. And so the Pharisees and the Sadducees, Sadducees, they are ticked off. They are mad because this guy is claiming to be the Messiah. Some people are believing it, some people aren't. So the crowd is getting stirred up and there is a lot of commotion happening. They are actually trying to decide if they should kill Jesus. All sorts of stuff is happening at this festival. And I'll tell y'all, I love some festivals. I will be at the Hot Air Balloon Festival next week. But you know when a ruckus starts happening at a festival, right? Everybody's watching. Everybody's looking. And so that's what's happening here. Jesus, in uh, verse, uh, verse 12 of chapter 8, it says that he says this, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness but will have the light of life. They will have the light of life. Jesus said something crazy. And this, this just really shook things up again here at this festival. And the reason it was so crazy is because Jesus was claiming to be the light of the world. 
And we've talked a lot recently about not reading the Bible with your like American 20th century like viewpoint, right? Like you kind of have to go back and find out what's going on in culture. Well, at this festival, how many know at festivals, there's like kind of festivals inside the festivals, right? Well, there's a ritual called the ritual of lanterns that would have been happening at this festival. And what that is, is they would have taken lanterns and put them all over the tabernacle, and then they would have lit all of those lanterns. And this Bible teacher that I've been learning from recently, she says that typically when Jesus was saying something, that there was a visual representation of whatever he was teaching or saying that the people were, were picking up what he was putting down because they maybe saw it. They were, they were experiencing it. And so when Jesus, I can just imagine maybe that the ritual of the lanterns is happening and the whole tabernacle is just lit up and Jesus walks in and he says, I'm the light of the world. I'm the light. You guys are looking at this light, but I'm the light. And so it was radical, right? It was unexpected. And so what I want you to see, the key thought on your outline that I want you to get today is that you are developed in the dark when you encounter the light. And the light, I mean Jesus, right? You are developed in the dark. So don't be afraid to go into the dark with Jesus. Don't be afraid to go into the dark room. So I want to talk about three things that will be developed in you when you start meeting with the light. The first thing is this. You develop a sensitivity to the light. One of the worst ways to wake someone up is by what? Flipping on the light switch, right? Oh, my son Carter, if I flip on the light switch, it's going to be a bad day in the forest house. He will be cranky from that moment on. When you flip on that light, right, when somebody flips on the light, you're like, oh, I mean, it, you, you just want to cover your eyes, right? Because you're sensitive to the light because you've been in the dark. Or when you're out like camping with your friends and you're playing like flashlight tag. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I got one other cool person in here. Anybody else ever play flashlight tag? Yeah, all right, woohoo. Yeah, and they like shine the light in your eyes though, and you're like, oh. Or tomorrow morning, tomorrow morning, because you are like, I am developing spiritual disciplines. You get up at 5 a.m., your alarm clock goes off, you're so excited, and you're tiptoeing into the kitchen, and you're like, I'm not gonna wake my husband up because he'll talk about it on stage. And then, and then you go in, and then you accidentally flip on the wrong light, and all the lights in the house come on, right? And you're like, oh. Because you're sensitive to the light. When we get in the dark, we will become sensitive to the light. Jesus is light. He is the light. And he wants to shine his light onto places in your life that may be a little bit sensitive. But if you allow him to do it, if you allow him, if you develop a sensitivity to his light, I promise you that it will be worth it. It'll be worth it. The scripture I want to look at is in one chapter over, and this, um, this is considered to be still in the same time frame of this festival. And Jesus and his disciples are walking around the city, and it says that they walk uh, upon a blind man, Okay. And this blind man in the scripture, it tells us that he has been blind since birth. And so the disciples immediately ask Jesus, they say, who sinned, this man or his parents? And that may be a weird thing that you think that they asked, but there was this YouTube uh, preacher uh, in Jesus's day that was teaching things such as health and wealth meant that you were loved by God and poverty and disease meant sin. And so they had some people saying some things. And so the disciples, that is what they thought in their head because that's what they had been taught. So they see this man and they ask Jesus, who sinned, this man or his parents? And in verse three, Jesus says this. He says, neither this man nor his parents sinned, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, here it is again, I am the light of the world. Jesus claims to be the light of the world again. And then it says, after saying this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. He then said, go, 
wash in the pool of Siloam. And so the man went and washed, and he came home seeing. He came home seeing. Now, as I was reading this and preparing, I, I, I thought, why would Jesus say all of this before healing the blind man. Because if you're reading through scripture, if you're reading through the New Testament, he doesn't teach a lot before he heals somebody typically. He just usually will heal them and, and, and they go on their way and there's just like this big moment, right? But as I'm reading this and, and Jesus says, neither this man or his parents, but it is so that God will be glorified. Like that is why. It made me think that Jesus was not he wasn't just going to heal this blind man. He was teaching a spiritual principle here. Because see, we are blind spiritually from birth. We are born with a spiritual blindness. Blindness is, is a condition that can happen uh, for lots of different reasons. But the way vision works, the way seeing works, just like that camera has to let in light to capture a picture and then you have to have light in the dark room to see something, your, your eyes are open and then light hits the retina. And your retina is a light-sensitive tissue. It's a light-sensitive tissue that then sends a message, message to your brain. And so this blind man needed to encounter the light. He needed to count, encounter Jesus so that Jesus could heal him. But I'm telling you that our spiritual blindness needs to encounter Jesus' light. We need to have our spiritual retina be so sensitive to Jesus' light so that we can start walking around seeing, so that we can say, I was blind, but now I see. I was lost, but now I'm found. And Jesus wants your spiritual blindness to encounter his light. So you've got to get in the dark room to encounter the light. But here's the problem. Light sensitivity isn't fun, right? Like these lights right now, every time I glance up, I'm like, sometimes that's what it's like when Jesus is showing us our stuff, right? When he shines that light, you're kind of like, mm, no. <laughs> you know, that, that's, that's what we want to do. We want to throw up our hands and we want to hide from the light. But this is the deal. Don't keep those sensitive things in the dark. Let Jesus shine a light on them. Let him have them. He's not scared of it. I promise you, that's why he came, so that you would be spiritually set free, so that your spiritual blindness would be gone. Jesus wasn't. He wasn't afraid to touch the unclean. In his day, to touch somebody who had a disease made the clean unclean. Jesus wasn't afraid. He said, come on, bring it on. I'll heal it. I won't just touch it, I'll heal it and I'll set you free. He came for the unholy. He came for the sick and the lost. And we have got to be willing to let the light be shined upon those places that we wanna keep hidden. We've gotta be willing for that. And I'll tell you, it's a beautiful thing when you get into that, that dark, quiet, intimate moment with God and then you allow that sensitivity of his light to shine, and then he heals you, it's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing, and that is how you will build your history and your relationship with God as he develops you. It's the, it's the sanctifying process in relationship with him. And see, this blind man who is blind since birth is teaching us something about our condition, and we have to get desperate for the light to heal and develop us. We have to get desperate for that. There's a verse in Psalms 139 that actually says, search me, oh God. Go pray that and then be ready to have a flashlight shined on that place, but be willing to give it over to him. Can you imagine the blind man? It says here that Jesus spit on the ground, made some mud from spit, which is disgusting, right? And then he puts it on his eyes and it doesn't say Jesus and his disciples walked with him to the pool. No, it just said go. Go wash yourself in the pool. There are times that Jesus is going to shine a light on something and then he's going to tell you to walk in obedience. And it's going to be in that obedience that the healing is going to come. It's going to be in that walking. Can you imagine that blind man? I don't know how far the pool of Shalom was from, from this place that they met him. But I imagine it was at least long enough for a blind person to, to wonder, why do I have spit on my eyes? 
What is this man thinking? What, what, what's going to happen when I get there? What if nothing happens when I get there? No, but this man was desperate. He was desperate to be healed. He was desperate, and he had this encounter with a man named Jesus, and so he was willing to walk. He was willing to obey. So when you're in the dark room and the light tells you to go apologize to somebody, trust him. Walk that path. Walk that way. When you're in the dark room and he tells you to forgive somebody who's never even asked for forgiveness, trust him that it is going to heal you and that it's going to set you free. When he tells you, leave that addiction right there and trust me, don't pick it up again. I have something more for you. Walk in obedience because his power plus your obedience will bring healing in your life. So when you get in the dark room and meet with the light, be ready. Be ready for him to start showing you and healing you. The next thing that is developed in the dark is your sense of hearing. The next thing is your sense of hearing. A couple nights ago, I was uh, falling asleep. I was thinking about this message, and I heard something crash in the kitchen. Because when you're in the dark, everything is louder, right? When you're in the dark, your, your ears are tuned to the stuff. But in the, the dark with Jesus, I don't want you to get scared about the things that you hear. I want you to start listening for Jesus' voice. Because he's going to start speaking to you. He is going to start whispering things to you. And when we get alone with Jesus, when we focus on intentional and spent time with him, and the, when the world is still dark, before you ever pick up your phone, he talked to, Todd talked about that last week, before you ever get into the world, get into the word. And listen to what the Father has to say to you. Develop your sense of hearing. The more time you spend in private with Jesus, the better you get to know his voice. The better you get to know his voice. I want to look, um, we're going to flip one more page over in John, in John chapter 10. And in verse 9, so this is not at the same festival, this is sometime later. In verse 9, Jesus says this, um, sorry, not verse 9, 10 verse 14. It says this, I am the good shepherd, I know my sheep and my sheep know me. And in verse 27, it says, my sheep listen to my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. The closer you get to God, the better you hear his voice. In first century, uh, uh, in in Jesus' time, a disciple of Jesus or a disciple of any other rabbi, they would say, you get so close, you follow so close behind your rabbi that the dust of their sandals is on you. That's how close we need to be following Jesus. Pastor Todd said a while back, and I wrote this down, and it's, it's something I have remembered since that day. He said, the closer you are, the clearer you hear. That is so true. The closer you are to Jesus, the clearer you know his voice, the clearer you hear him. The clearer we hear him. And here's the thing. The more you know God and his character, the more you know his voice. Where do you get to know God's character? In his word. The more you value his voice, the more his image is developed on the inside of you. The more you know when it says that you are holy and chosen and dearly loved, the more you walk that out. The more you believe it about yourself. The more you know he loves you, the more you want to hear it. The more you want to hear his voice. I could listen to my husband tell me how he loves me all day long. I could listen to it all day because we love that. We love to know that we're loved. And it's so crazy because here, when Jesus is talking about being the good shepherd and his sheep know him and he knows his sheep, it's really weird that that translates love. Because you're like, why does being a shepherd translate love? Well, let me just tell you, these were sheep people. Back in the day, they were sheep people. This is a shepherding community. It's kind of like Kim. She's a cat person. So when Kim says, I know my cats and my cats know me, I know my cats and they know my voice, we get it, right? (laughs) Because she's a cat person. Jesus is saying, I love you. I am your shepherd. Know my voice. Know how much I love you. Get into my word. Start hearing my words over you and for you. In Ephesians 3, it actually says that, that the love of God is deep and wide and long and high. 
And it actually surpasses all understanding. You know what that means? It means it goes from a, a, a understanding that we can understand in our brain to a heart understanding. And when you start to hear and know his word and his love for you, your hearing will get so much better. My son Carter, he is ending fifth grade and he's going into sixth grade. And right now, his little friend, Sydney, she's our neighbor, she's in sixth grade. And right now, in our car, every afternoon after school, there's all sorts of crush conversations going on, okay? And there's the, oh, did Abby tell you she likes you? No, 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 I heard that she likes somebody else. And it's all these little, like, whispers. And, and it's crazy in my car, because I'm like, I don't get it. I was homeschooled, so I didn't have middle school crushes, right? Like, I'm like, I have no grid for this. Um, I, 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 I just hung out with my brothers, you know? So I don't even know, but, but all I know is there's a difference, though, when you hear a friend tell you how somebody feels about you versus when that person says it about you. Oh, there's a difference. And so there is a difference when we get up here on this stage and we tell you how much Jesus loves you and how much God loves you and how he cares about you and how he has plans for your purpose and your future. But there's a difference when you start getting in the dark room with Jesus and you start reading this and you're having some comparison issues, but then you read Psalms 139 and he says, no, 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 you're fearfully and wonderfully made in your mind. There's a difference when he speaks it to you versus when I tell you about it. Get in the dark room and start listening to God's voice. Let his light transform you. Let his words transform you. Let his word transform you. Because it will if you let it. It will if you let it. The third thing that gets developed, and, and there's so many things, guys. If, you, if you'll start putting these spiritual disciplines in place, so much will be developed in your life, I promise you. I can't go into all of them. But I, I, the third thing that I believe can be developed that I really saw in these passages of scripture is that you develop the ability to walk in the light. You develop the ability to walk in the light. How many of you guys, when you are on a dark path, maybe playing flashlight tag if you're real cool, um, <laughs> you're thankful when you can shine that flashlight in front of you, right? Well, Jesus, he says he is the light, right? But then there's also places in here where it says his word is a light, a light unto our path. But then there's also another part where it says that you are the light. And so we're gonna look at 1 John 1 through, um, 1 John 1, 5 through 7, and it says this. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you, God is light. And we already know that that's true because we just read it in John, right? So he's saying, hey, Jesus said he was the light. And if we claim to have fellowship with him yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. Oh man, you guys, what he wants to develop on the inside of you is his image and his light in you so that it can shine out through you. And so that takes a personal relationship with God that takes personal faith. We say it all the time, it cannot just happen on Sunday morning. If the only time you are getting Jesus is on Sunday morning, it's not an adequate enough discipline and workout to develop you. Because you see, Sunday faith is a you-centered faith. Sunday faith is a faith where you say, what can I get from the church? What do they have for me? How many flowers can I get from the Mother's Day flower truck? I'm just kidding, y'all can have those, we love you. Um, but Sunday faith is this, what does it offer me? What does this church have for my kids? Because I don't even know what to tell them about Jesus, so I'm gonna let the church do it. Because I don't have, I'm not in the dark room getting to know Jesus so I can, can show the light to my kids. Sunday faith, that type of faith, is a you-centered faith, and that won't work in this world. Because now let's talk about the real dark. There is darkness, there is an enemy, and we are meant to be a light, but that light only shines through us when we get in the dark to meet with the light. So the, that is the wrong view of church, is what, what can I get from it? 
but instead, how has God, what has he put me in this church for? Who has he, who has he put me here to serve? How can I serve my community? How can I get involved? How can I be a part of this body so that I'm encouraged and I'm built up as well? Because you are developed by the light, not for yourself, but for others. You are developed by the light for others. That was Jesus's plan all along. It was for you to, to say, I once was blind, but now I see. Let me tell you about a man named Jesus. Let me tell you about him. He had like the original network marketing plan set up, <laughs> right? Like it, it works. If we all go out and start sharing this love of Jesus, it works. In Matthew 5, 14, Jesus says that you are the light. It actually says that we, the church, we're a city on a hill. But guess what? Our light can't shine bright if it's the five of us and our staff up here. Just standing by ourselves. That's not a city on a hill. It's not just our dream team shining bright. It's the whole lot of us getting in the dark room, meeting with the light so that the light of Jesus will shine through us. And it says this, it says, you are the light of a world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see the good deeds and glorify the Father in heaven. Why was that man born blind? To glorify the Father. Why are you set free? So that your light will shine. So that your light will shine bright. Because you see the transforming, developing light of Jesus Christ. He loves you too much to leave you in your sin. And he loves the world too much as well. So your life should be transformative, not just for yourself, but for others. And so that is the challenge to this church today, because guess what, Anchor Point, we want to be a light to this community, to the city of Foley. We want to be a church that loves our community until they ask us why. We have an opportunity, Pastor Ryan's gonna tell you about it in a few minutes, called Feed Foley, where you're gonna get to be a light to the world. In the Old Testament, it talked about Moses meeting with God. And it said that there were times, uh, one time he came off the mountain and his light, his face shined so bright that the people were actually terrified because he was shining so bright. Does your light shine like that because of the time you spend with Jesus? Do you want to be developed in the dark by meeting with the light? So I want our church to stand up today because I want to challenge you guys to start getting into the dark room with Jesus. Start developing these spiritual disciplines. Start meeting with him, getting in the word because we want your light to shine. And what we're gonna do, the way we're gonna end this service, y'all are gonna love me. You're gonna be so excited. I want everybody to hold your finger up like this. Does anybody know where I'm going with this one? Hopefully. Y'all remember that old Sunday school song, This Little Light of Mine? Okay, I'm not gonna make y'all sing the put it under a bushel part, okay? We're not gonna sing that part. And Pastor Matt's gonna have to help me because my voice, y'all don't really wanna hear me sing. But, but I will say, singing a children's song is one of the easiest ways to sing, okay? Here's the deal with this though. Some of the this old Sunday school songs, man, they can be some of the most simple and powerful prayers that you can sing over your kids or with your kids and in your life. So we're gonna sing this today as we depart out because I want Anchor Point Church to go out and be a light to this city. And I know that it's in y'all. I know you guys are hungry. I know y'all wanna be spiritually buff walking in here. <laughs> and I'm so excited to be a part of this church because guys, we are loving a city until they ask us why. So let's sing it together. But Pastor Matt, you're gonna have to Get me going, because I don't even know what a key is. Light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Get your light up. Everybody. I'm gonna let it shine. You back there, come on. This little light of mine. Louder. I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine. 
God, we just come to you, Lord, and we thank you. I thank you for every single person in this room today. Lord, I thank you that you love us so much that you are not willing to leave us in our blind state, God, but that you love us so much that you want to see us set free and then share that same love with others. So God, I pray over this church right now, Lord, as, as we are growing as a body of believers together, Lord, as they start to get into the dark room and meet with the light, God, that you would just start to develop them, Lord. That as you shine a light onto those, those deep places, Lord, those places that maybe hurt a little bit, those places that maybe we don't want to uh, show, but we wanna keep hidden, God, that they would, they would respond to you. Lord, that they would let you heal them. Lord, that they would deeply know the love of the shepherd. And Lord, that in turn, your image would be developed on the inside of them, that they would go out and be a light.